welcome to Modern Anarchy, the podcast featuring real conversations with conscious objectors to the status quo. I'm your host, Nicole. Hello, hello. On today's episode, we have PhD candidate in sociology, Jesse Holzman. Join us for a conversation all about community building and accessibility. Together, we talk about living with the lens of autism, being entitled to take up space, and the beautiful rabbit hole of questioning the status quo. I mean, y'all, that is spot on with the mission of the podcast. You know this is going to be a fun conversation. Once you question gender, once you question sexuality, you question relationships, I mean, where does the questioning end? And we had a fun time talking about the way our relationships are seeped in culture and the way that those cultural constructs do have real meaningful impacts on the way that we move through the world. Y'all are going to enjoy this episode, I can promise you that. And also, it is my birthday week. Cheers to that. I will be celebrating. And with that, I wanted to ask a sweet little present from all of you listeners around the world that tune into the podcast each week. I feel bashful just getting to ask for what I want for my birthday from you listeners, but I would love for you to rate the podcast whatever you feel like it's called to be rated. I'm not going to say five stars because I'm biased, obviously. But whatever you feel like the podcast should be rated at, if you could go rate the podcast on Spotify, on iTunes, whatever medium you're using to listen to the podcast, it would really mean a lot to me because that is how we get the word out, right? Increased ratings means that the show is promoted to more people. And then we have more people asking these really great provoking questions that are going to bring about the change in society that we are hoping to create. And with that, thank you to all of you listeners that tune in each week. Truly, it means the world to me to see that we have built a community of listeners and that you are a part of that. So thank you to you. All right, everyone, let's tune in. Okay, well then I guess what specifically I tend to like to focus on yeah, is your story. Not what you do, but like your story, how you got to being here, how you got to doing all of these things. And so in that way, it's very personal typically is what I like to do. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think my question for you would be like, Mm -hmm. what aspects, how I got to do, like, there's so many things that I do. Um, And we're not talking about like for work. I'm talking about like my passion lies in like community building, community Mm -hmm. bridging in multiple different communities in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess I could start there. Yeah. (laughs) Tell me, yeah. Tell me what made you passionate about that? Where does that journey for you start? Yeah. So it's been a lot of the, sounds funny. I've been investigating it a lot lately because there for me um, has been a kind of a new self-awareness. So like I have been more recently kind of claiming and identifying as autistic and that, right, that lens is, Mm. right, I'm reflecting back on my experiences and being like, oh yeah, like this makes a lot of sense. And I'm also too, I've been doing a lot of work with my therapist surrounding, right, being disabled, being neurodivergent, and there has definitely been a lot of ableism that I have totally embodied, right? Mm -hmm. And so doing a lot of work disrupting that. And so what that has kind of looked like is paying a little bit more attention to how I move through the world. And so for me, I think I've come into community building, community bridging, really through the lens of that create structure for me to interact with folks in a way that feels much more scripted, much safer, much more bounded um, and purposeful. And not like purposeful from like a capitalistic way of like, we all have to like be doing things to be a value, not really through that lens, but like, cool, I want to interact with these people and I want to hang out, but I can't, I can't just make small talk. That, Mm. That feels really weird. But when I am organizing, when I am building and bridging community, right, like I am introducing people, I am Mm -hmm. asking questions to figure out 
who people are, what do they do, what are their values, what are they passionate about? I'm like, oh, cool. Like, you vibe with these people. Like, right. let me introduce you. Um, and then kind of like let things unfold there. And then also in terms of spaces, right? Really, right? Not only am I autistic, but I'm also a sociologist. And so I am really good, which like, again, all maps onto each other so neatly. <laughs> I'm really good at finding patterns, right? And I'm really good at seeing when things don't line up, right? And so there's so often, quote unquote, places or spaces that are like, hey, these are available for these types of folks. And I'm like, no, no, they're not. They're not. Like, you say they're safe, but who are they safe for? Mm. Because, like, safety doesn't always look the same for everybody. Yeah. And so I do think for me, like my story, right, really, there is no start, there is no finish. It just is like a continuing to evolve. Like, I don't know if you mm. grew up like reading those ghost, not Ghostbusters, uh, the Goosebumps book, like create your own ending. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That's really kind of how mm. it has felt with me is like different layers as different things keep unraveling, different options keep opening up for me to continue doing this work and uh, shifting what work looks like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. To things that feel comfortable for you and safe for you. Oh. Yes. Um, yes and no. Mm. So yeah, like comfortable, I would say to some regard. But part of also a lot of the work that I do is, is, is being uncomfortable, like being comfortable, mm. being uncomfortable, right? Mm. So even like pushing boundaries of things, right, of what things can look like. But for me, it does rely on that structure, right? So like when, like there's a role, right? There's a hat that I wear. Mm. And so that hat for me creates those expectations that other people, right, like if I just walk into a social situation, right, there is no necessarily expectations for how I'm going to show up, right? There's so many different ways that I can behave or um, interact with people. But when I am in like an organizer hat or mm -hmm. um, a host role, right, I have a better understanding of what those expectations look like than just showing up as, as a Jesse. Sure, 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 yeah. sure, sure. So I'm curious then – what is showing up as a Jesse for you? Yeah, that is that is a great question. I uh, so not that this therapist that I'm working at, but like a few therapists ago, they posed this question of like, do you ever exist in community spaces where you're not organizing? Mm. And I was like, no, that is not not a thing that I do, and not a thing that happens very often. And so I have definitely lately taken a more conscious role of not always being in a position of leadership, of being really intentional about what I am taking on, what I am not taking on, that kind of stuff. And so like a really great example is I, um, I do a lot of Japanese rope bondage. I tie at a really great studio called Heartland Kambaku. Absolutely amazing. It is co-run um, by a non-binary person and a woman of color. They do some really great work. I always like to preface that they are not perfect, but they definitely are aware of that. And I trust that they are doing the work. So, and that's kind of what I look for. There have definitely been opportunities, right? For me to step up and step in in different ways. And I was like, no, I love you all. And I really just want to be a student here. Right. Mm. And so like thinking about different spaces that I occupy and ways that I can pull back and to just show up. Mm. But also I was only able to do that in my opinion, because I feel really comfortable in that space. Right. Sure. Like most of the people who go there are, are some sort of neurodivergent. The space itself, I would say is very queer centered. I don't, I don't feel like I need to mask in the same Beautiful, way yeah. I have to in other spaces. Mm. And so like, even last night when I was in class and I'm like an advanced student or whatever. And so I'm with people who have tons of experience and I, I love being in that space. I like started cracking jokes uh, and I was like, oh, it looks like my ADHD meds have worn off. Right. And like, so everybody ch chuckles yeah, and yeah. like my tying partner was like, oh, the authentic Jesse is out. Right. Um, uh -huh. And so it just like feels really great mm. to be able to be seen in those ways of yes. like, yeah, yeah, of like, cool, we all know the difference between Jesse on their meds and Jesse off their meds. And 
they are great either way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the love within that that you know is present in that space. Yes, yes, absolutely. And for me, that's kind of what I look for, right, Mm -hmm. is like when I get goofy, right, or lose the filter a little bit, right, just get silly and I'm not, right, so self-contained because like also like my body moves in ways and I'm not always aware of like where my hands Mm -hmm. are or like the space that I'm taking up, right? Those aspects are supported and not Mm -hmm. not shamed, right? I'm not Mm -hmm. asked to like, hey, can you make yourself smaller or like, hey, can you blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, 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 we're going to meet you where you're at. Mm -hmm. Um, And right, the goal is always about that space, right? Making sure that everybody in that space feels held and supported and the ways that work for that community. And so for me, those are the things that I kind of look for in order to be able to show up authentically and kind of like let my guard down more and not Mm -hmm. feel like I need to wear these organizer hats, right? Mm -hmm. Or these you know, host hats or whatever we want to call them. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a beautifully healing space. Yes, it, it definitely has yeah. been. Definitely. I'm thinking about the people who who don't understand your experience of what it means to be wearing a mask or a filter. Yeah. Could you describe more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So like I have very vivid memories of like growing up at a really young age and like I didn't have this language then right but I would go to school um so let me also preface with like some of my other identities too because I do think that those matter um Mm -hmm. for the context of the story right so I am a non-binary person I was socialized as a girl growing up which really does matter for a lot of this because we think about how gender socialization plays a role in how we are taught to utilize our bodies, right? To express different things. So we can think about like physical space, how much space girls are taught to take up or not take up. Even the clothes that we are expected to wear, how they can limit mobility, uh, how girls are taught to, right, stay clean or not get their dresses dirty or, hey, we don't wrestle, we're not rough and tumble, all of those kind of different things, as opposed to boys, right? Rough housing, it's a boy thing that kind of stuff, right? Right. That gender binary aspect of stuff. So I have very vivid memories of growing up and going to elementary school and like setting goals for myself for the day of like watching girls, right? And being like, okay, in order to do a good job being a girl, I need to make sure I don't get markers on my hands, right? Or like try not to like dirty my outfit or let's see if I can keep my hair nice and like crisp in the way that my mom put it up before I left the house. And then just like constantly like failing at those like gendered expectation stuff, right? And so that's like definitely part of it is like those attempts. So like that's like the gender socialization part, right? Which is imbued Mm -hmm. in kids no matter what as we grow up, right? And so those expectations also come into the role of what it it looks like to operate in the class, right? We don't speak out. We have to raise our hands. And so, like, I have ADHD. I'm autistic. I didn't learn how to read until fourth grade. Like, I'm dyslexic. There's a whole bunch of different learning needs, also different sensory needs. Like, I need a lot of physical input in order to stay grounded in a lot of situations, especially Mm -hmm. when there's, like, different auditory stimulation going on or different visual stimulation, right? If I'm in a different setting or especially like if I'm attempting to read a room, right? Mm. I don't know these people. I don't know how they're going to respond, right? And so there's a lot going on. And so thinking about elementary school, right? There's these specific expectations. The time, like I grew up in the 90s, um, these expectations were put on all students regardless of individual learning needs, right? Mm. So We're expected to sit at our desk in a prolonged period of time with two feet on the floor, keeping our hands to yourself, right? Part of what I am now realizing is like, I stim a lot. Like I move my bodies in ways in order to give myself physical input, right? Which like parents would be like, oh, that's distracting to other students. Well, like your neurotypical kid who's clicking the pencil or not the pencil, the pen cap, right? Yep. And every like, no, that right? That is distracting or um, just thinking about like different people's learning needs, right? Yeah. And so like having to confine my body to a specific Mm -hmm. desk for a prolonged period of time makes my body feel like I need to jump out of my skin, Mm -hmm. right? Like it physically is almost painful to be forced to do that, right? Or even be forced to have to constantly filter 
when I am saying and hold in and try to remember what I want to say, because mm-hmm. it will disappear. My brain, like my thought patterns move so quickly that if I think of something this second in two seconds, it's gone. Right. Uh, and so like, I always share that, like my superpowers, I process, I process really fast. I can take in a ton of information mm-hmm. and give you like those key components really quickly, yeah. but we have about five seconds to do that. Um, and then after that, my brain is like on to the next thing. Yeah. And so having, being able to do that again, right. Superpower, if it is right, given the right environment to kind of like thrive and build on, but like education is not built Mm. for people who have different learning needs, right. Who have disabilities. Yes. And so basically I, I, I used to spend all day thinking about how do I sit like other people? How do I move through the other world, like the world, like other people? How do I make sure I don't take up too much space in a classroom? Right. How do I make sure I talk the appropriate amount? How do I make sure I phrase things in ways that are palatable for other people? So I always joke around and like, I've learned to tell people that I work with, like, I'm a really direct communicator. Like I won't, I like have done a lot of work on it. And like, it's very obvious. I try to do it when I'm writing emails, but I'm like, Hey, I hope you're having a good Thursday. The weather is nice. So I call that neurotypical fluffing. Um, It is things that I do to make other people feel more comfortable. I asked neurotypical and holistic people. So holistic meaning non-autistic people to like try not to do that for me because they're taking up unnecessary space in my brain that just like does not do anything for me. So I'm like, don't, don't worry about the fluff. You don't have to do that. Give me the information I need, right? And so as an elementary school kid like these were the things that I was constantly having to do and think about that the other people weren't right so in order to fit in right or to be deemed appropriate or palatable or respectful or what other key words that were important for teachers like I had to constantly police the way that I moved through the world and what that means is that is taking away energy from the things that I should have been doing right I should have been focusing on math should have been focusing on reading or physical activity or art, but like, that's not what I was focused on. I was focused on like, okay, like my body wants to get out of the chair, but I can't get out of the chair. So like, how can I stay seated for the extra 15 minutes so I don't get in trouble, right? Or I disagree with the teacher, right? What the teacher said is like factually not completely accurate because they're missing a word or whatever it is, right? Because like my brain is like, no, there are facts and they're right. Things are very black and white again, working on it because there are a lot of gray areas of things, but like, I, like there, I like wound up running into my fifth grade teacher years and years ago. Um, and he shared with me, like, one of the things that I always remember about you is you constantly challenging authority and having no, uh, no problem doing it. Because for me, it was like black and white, right? Like if somebody is wrong, regardless of their positionality, like I'm going to tell them that they're wrong. And so when I talk about masking, it goes back to all of those things that I shared earlier about thinking of how I move through the space in ways that like neurotypical and holistic people right, don't have to do because those things come really naturally for them. Like how much eye contact is too much eye contact, right? Like, or how do I catch people's eyes just enough for them to know that I'm listening, but not enough to like suck my energy out of me? Mm. Yeah. I mean, hearing all this, it sounds exhausting. Yeah. And it definitely was. And so like coming home from elementary school, like my mom was always, and again, she didn't have the language at the time she does now. She went back to school for uh, vocational therapy, right? Or she's a vocational counselor now and got a lot of training on how to work right with kiddos with disabilities. Both me and my brother have variety, but like she didn't have the capacity at that time to really have that language, mm. but she did a good job being able to just like, let me unwind. And so she gave me at least an hour. I remember like always coming home and she would like have a set of Oreo cookies ready for me and a glass of milk and would just let me veg out because mm. what she knew is that I was always angry and very short tempered, but like by the time I got home, because I was so exhausted, right. From having to do additional tasks that other, other young people didn't have to do. Yeah. I can imagine 
how exhausting it is to move through those spaces with multiple people to, yeah, be processing all of that up there, that after a long day at school, you need to settle down to have those cookies to settle back into your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then like, so thinking about adulthood, I now have gotten to actually it was COVID. So me and my grounding partner, and I'll stop there and I'll explain what a grounding partner is. Mm -hmm. So I, I am consensually non-monogamous. Polyamorous is the term that we use to describe or that I use to describe the types of relationships I have with people. I use the term grounding partner to talk about the partner that I live with. Um, other people will use things like nesting. Nesting for me sounds like we're going to have kids together. There's no desire to have kids. So we're not like building a nest for babies. Sure. People will use anchor partner. Anchor sounds like ball and chain, which sounds like weights, right? It doesn't feel true, great for us. True, true. And then so Jessica Stein has a really great book called Poly Secure. Um, and she talks about like a safe, I think it's like home base or safe haven or something like that. And we're like, oh, that feels really good. Like we ground off of each other, right? Mm. We go out, we explore the world. And then we, co we come to reground and like do that together. That doesn't yeah, mean that beautiful. it only has to be us, right? Different points in time, we can have multiple people, multiple grounding partners. But for right now, right, like that is one of the key ways that we talk about our relationship. And so mm -hmm. uh, me and my grounding partner, we got COVID in like, what, <laughs> March 2020, as COVID was big. And I was sick for about two months, like in bed, and just like could not move through the world. And I'm still experiencing uh, like long hauler stuff about like chronic exhaustion and mm -hmm. right, like two years later, which has wow. like forced me to think about disability in different ways, right? Because I am constantly tired. I don't have the capacity to mask as much as I used to because I don't have the energy for it, mm -hmm. right? Because it takes so much energy. And so I've had to figure out a way to, if I want to keep doing the stuff that I want to do, right? If I want to keep organizing, if I want to keep rock climbing and doing rope and working on my dissertation and all these things, yeah. then something has to give. And for me, that was masking mm. um, and spending so much time trying to make other people comfortable while making myself uncomfortable. Oh. And so it means like really honest conversations with people about like, hey, I like wanted to, like one of my friends is getting bottom surgery coming up here. And I was like, hey, like, my polycule, I really want to do X, Y, and Z for this person. However, I need support. Can somebody remind me that like, this is something I want to do in a week and check back in to see where I'm at on it, right? And so figuring out ways to ask for support in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and also being really clear about like, hey, like I'm a really direct communicator. And so if I forget to ask you like, hey, how was your weekend? And I jump into like work stuff right? You can, you can definitely be like, Hey, slow down. Like, let's check in first. But being able to outsource some of that of like, Hey, if this is something that you need, I'm going to need support and remembering to do that for you. Because if it's not a priority of mine, mm. it's going to potentially fall by the wayside in terms of like some of those like social skills or emotional intelligence yeah. things that people talk about. Yeah. And that's the beauty of knowing that you're autistic and knowing mm -hmm what you need and now being able to ask for it in a community that is supporting you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think too, I'm finding the more and more individuals who are talking about their, like the different needs that they have, even if they're not autistic, right? Like it, it just helps build the community even more, right? Of thinking about the ways that we all learn differently yeah. or we all need different supports. So like even be able to show up in friendships. I'm not going to be the friend who's going to call you every week on Thursday to like check in with you. Like it's not, <laughs> not going to happen unless it's like a constant thing that we've been doing for years. But like getting that into the pattern is like, once it's in the pattern, it's great. Once it's in the routine, but mm. creating that routine is just probably not possible for me. Yeah. Right. And so being able to like share that with people of like, cool, if that's something that you need, like you're going to have to initiate it um, and then I'm happy to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's beautiful that they're meeting you in that. And part of that is the knowledge then of what is it that you need? How did you come to recognize the different things that you could actually ask for them? I feel like a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. So I am a PhD candidate at University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and these are conversations I've had with 
other grad students there, mm -hmm. faculty members there, students there, is when I would teach at UIC, a lot of the conversations I would have with students is teaching them how to be entitled, right? How to be entitled and ask for what they need um, and in some cases demand what they need, right? To take up space. And I want to be like very clear that there are a lot of times specifically like white, cis, heterosexual, able-bodied men need to take up less space. And so like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying like white people need to take up more space. I, I am white, right? That is a primary identity of mine and something that I constantly, for me, what it means to be, part of what it means to be anti-racist is constantly thinking about how my whiteness is showing up in spaces, right? Yes. And so definitely, right, like that definitely is something I'm constantly thinking about. But in terms of like coming to figure out what I need, part of that has been thinking about and treating and being entitled, pretending, right, that I am entitled and like, cool, if I could ask for what I need, like, what is my body telling me? Um, what do I need to feel more successful in this space? How do I, I move through the world trying to reduce my workload at all times, right? And so I've had to have a lot of conversations with my partner about like, if we cook dinner together and cook family style and just put the whole tray into the fridge without dividing it into plastic containers, I will just not heat my food up if I'm going to eat. Because like the idea of having to take it out, put it into an extra container, like a plate, and dirty that plate so I have to do that dish later and then put it into the microwave and press the buttons like well that doesn't feel like a lot of work to most people for me that's like 15 steps and I'm mm. like that's extra labor I didn't necessarily need to do in that moment and so like I don't need to heat up my food to survive if I'm just eating and so I really for me if it's about increasing my energy reserve I need to figure out how to reduce those steps right so figuring mm. out the ways that I can do that and so for me, really thinking about what my needs are as a person and then figuring out how, how to ask for them, who, who to go to, right? Like, cause definitely there are some people I can't ask for things, right? And I, and I know that because it's either not safe, mm -hmm. um, usually cause it's not safe, also capacity, right? And so I do also always try to have conversations with people about like, Hey, um, before I ask you for something, do you, do you have the capacity to be asked these questions, right? And so like in our group of friends, we it comes from disability scholarship, right? It's called Spoons, right? Have you heard yes. of Spoons? Yes. 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 And so it's a way to talk about energy resources. And so I'll have check-ins with friends before I like, uh, hey, do you have the spoons to have this hard conversation? Or do you have the capacity uh, to hold space for me? Or like, I just need to vent. Or I really can't pick up my prescription. <laughs> like for whatever reason, my body is telling me absolutely not yeah. or paying a parking ticket or whatever um, mm. those things are being able to like be okay with asking for help. Also being okay being told no, huge, which, which is really huge. And I like to say that like I am for some reason, I think it's like the autism and the ADHD. I don't have rejection sensitivity. And I think part of it is potentially framing that I've created to like get past that sure. of like, it is really hard to say no. And so when somebody says no to me, I feel that that's a gift that is them telling me that they feel comfortable and safe enough yeah. to be able to actually ask for what they need. And for me, that is like really priceless. Like mm -hmm. I, I want to be a safe enough person that people feel comfortable setting boundaries with Oof. and know that our relationship will be able to sustain that boundary because like mm. right, we always hope that they can and so being able to hear no and really see it as a gift has been I think really powerful for me and also being able to ask for things along the way uh, also trial and error like yeah. you don't know what's going to work and sometimes some things work for a second and then they never work again exactly. um, so also trying to be flexible in in that and also being accepting of like yeah some days, some things work. Other days, they don't. Um, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, think about learning how to ride a bike. You know, you, you go out there, you might fall off the first couple of times, but you only mm -hmm. learn by continuing to go with it. Yes. Yes. Right. And you also like maybe learning to ride a bike you first time try with your uncle, right? Mm -hmm. And he's not patient enough. And then you're like, cool. Well, I still have this goal of riding the bike. So what else can I do? Um, if I'm going to try by myself, I need knee pads. So who can I go to to ask for those knee pads? Or my best friend Sam just learned how to ride a bike. And so like maybe they have suggestions mm. on how they got there. I also crowdsource 
a ton. I don't move through the world uh, as an individual very often. I move through the world usually in different communities or groups yeah. uh, because I am, I really believe that like I am only able to get through things because of the people around me, right? Because of the knowledge that we can share because of the different information and the different standpoints that we come from, the different experiences and identities we hold. And mm -hmm. so really trying to outsource as much as I can, right? Because sure. I have learned that like society likes to tell us that we're alone in these things, that we should be like, right, that we should be shameful or like keep either our mental health stuff to ourselves and not talk about it or uh, the things that we're diagnosed with, medical things, like we need to be silent about them and struggle in isolation. But I have learned that like, for me, that is not how I continue to survive and thrive. It's like, I continue to survive and thrive because I talk about the, these things because I get to say like, hey, you got put on this ADHD medication. How is it working for you? Oh, it's also giving you like feelings of depression. Okay, cool. I'm not alone in that. Like, cool. Oh, you switch medication? Oh, you can switch medications? Wait, what? You don't have to just sit, stay on a medication that isn't working? Or even like pushing back against medical professionals. I think that we oftentimes are taught to just blindly trust doctors. And like, I have learned that like, I also work at a children's hospital and mm -hmm. I have learned a lot that doctors are also people and don't know everything. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And so sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, we as people know better about what our bodies need. And so again, outsourcing that, like, hey, this is what I'm going through. You know, like I feel in my experience, I had HPV, well, I still have HPV. HPV doesn't go away, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, had abnormal, I call them squeamish cells. It's not squeamish, it's squamish. <laughs> um, but I still like to I call them it. squeamish. It makes it cuter. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember doctors being like, hey, you have to go get a copo, right? Which is not a great procedure. And I think I was like, I just turned 30 at the time. And uh, the doctor was like, yeah, if you were a few years younger, we wouldn't have done this procedure because like you, the assumption is you, you probably had HPV for a while and your body just hasn't cleared it. And like, I'm like, I'm a polyamorous person. I am having sex with new partners regularly. And so this idea that like I had HPV for a while and like it should have gone away is where are you getting that from? Right. And so it was this question of like, is that assumption grounded in the fact that like I am 30 and should be married yeah. or in a monogamous relationship or like mm. where, where is that coming from? And so yeah. like I, I talked to a bunch of people. I talked to my mom. I talked to like my friends and said like, hey, how have you handled this in the past? Like and got a lot of information and was able to go back to my doctors and say like, no, we're not, we're not going to do this. And here's why. And they were like, well, I still think we should. And I was like. Hmm, let's frame this differently. And I was like, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. I don't want to do it. And they're like, oh, okay, we'll now listen to you. Wow. Right? We'll give you back that agency autonomy over your body, which wow. is like, uh, wait, why, why did I have to like switch the reasons to be able to get my needs met? Like, I'm glad that I got heard, but like, it shouldn't take having to disclose something, right? No. In order to have a doctor trust that I, was comfortable waiting a year to see if like my body cleared it yeah. um, to then come back, which is now funny because years later, from my understanding that is now like the best practice is to give people's bodies a chance to clear it. So again, like I, I use that example to like highlight for me the importance of community and not moving through the world in isolation. Absolutely. Which is I th think also why community building is so big for me, right? Is Absolutely. Moving away from that isolation. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much pressure from patriarchal assumptions that the best thing that we need to do is to be completely independent. You figure out what yourself is, the ego. You know, we're talking like Freudian psychology back mm -hmm. in the day. This stuff is deeply laced within our cultural context of how we see the world. But I think it's important on what you're hitting on and for all humans is that we need community. This is not a question of if, it's a question of how much, you know, different people have different needs of what a community size feels for them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And everyone has different needs in that. And through that, we have interdependence. Mm -hmm. You can still be your own individual self, but you're interdependent with people around you. And that's the best way to thrive in relationship with people. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and also like all these ideas surrounding individuality, right? Like we can talk about how that's grounded in colonization and white supremacy um, and all these different forms of uh, structures of oppression yep. that, that are surrounding us. And so really too, I think a lot of what we're talking about, right, is people of color, indigenous folks, right, black people, brown people have been doing this work for a while. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that these conversations surrounding the importance of community, are, right, they're starting to happen more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this, at least for me personally, and I'd be curious what your thoughts are, is all deeply connected to how I see polyamory. Yes, yes, right? We... <laughs> I'm like laughing because I'm thinking back to like my prelims, preliminary examination for my PhD program. And we read this great piece about like how marriage is really the purchasing and buying of women, right? Because yes. women as property and yes. thinking about the origins of marriage, right, are grounded in, again, colonization and white ideas surrounding owning capital and uh, property and that kind of stuff. And um, being able to control and make sure that you, that the children, right, that are coming from your wife are actually yours, because God forbid some other kid that is not from your lineage takes claim over your property. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, the craziest part of that whole equation is that even within marriage, it wasn't expected that sexual fidelity was a part of that. Like everyone forgets this, like I think within our time, like that was not expected of the marriage at all. People, it was common to have a side person and they use that mm -hmm. sort of language where the male and only the male would be able to experience sexual pleasure, which is outside of the marriage. Mm-hmm. How do people Absolutely. how do people forget this part, right? Like the, I mean the 1950s, right? Like that's what happened and you mm -hmm. can probably tell me better than I can, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. And and I think too like it's it's purposely written out of what we are taught, right? Because like if the goals are yes. maintaining the hierarchy and the status quo as it is, sharing that information with uterus owners, right? Or people who can have children or people who want to have children, right? Um, shifts the power and control, right? If people can begin to question assumptions surrounding things, that means that the status quo might fall apart and the people who have power might now might not continue to hold that power. And that becomes really scary for folks. Yeah, yeah. Which is why <laughs> I love getting to have the podcast where we talk about it. Mm -hmm. So then tell me, yeah, what is polyamory to you? How do you understand it in your life? Yeah. So it's funny, like I, my dissertation is on something totally different, but if sure. I could like go back and think about what I would do a dissertation on now, I wouldn't actually change mine, but what I would be interested in doing research in the future on sure. is kind of the evolution of awareness surrounding different identities. Um, and so like, I have a hypothesis that a lot of folks first call into question sexuality, right? Like, oh my God, we don't have to be heterosexual. Like there's other things, right? We could be attracted to people regardless of gender, people of mm. all genders, people with specific types of gender, specific people with specific types of gender presentation, people with specific gender identity. Wait, what? Like, and that can be fluid and that can change, right? Like these are social constructs, right? And then once you begin to question sexuality, right, it becomes easier to question other things. Or right, maybe you begin to question gender or you begin to question monogamy, right? But once you begin to question some aspect of something that we are told is inherent, is in biological, is ingrained and must be true, then we're, you're like, what else is bullshit, right? Once you realize Santa yep. doesn't exist, you're like, wait, the Easter bunny also doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. Or does a tooth, tooth fairy? fairy? No. Right? And so for me, that's mm -hmm. kind of what coming into consensual non-monogamy um, and polyamory has looked like. It's like, um, cool, what is it that I want from relationship, right? What is it that I need from relationship? And for me, uh, again, polyamory is community, right? It's about having enough people to have a D&D &D campaign, um, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I joke about that, but it's also nice. But it, but it really is about building up your network of people to support you in the ways that you need to be supported. I was actually just watching um, a TikTok with my grounding partner that they sent to me. And it was th these two people who were, th the idea is great. It was like, but every night you should check in in order to build intimacy with your romantic 
the person you're in a romantic relationship with and ask them what need has not been met of theirs today and then either provide that need for them or like work with them to support on getting that need met right and i was like absolutely not like that is so for me that feels like such a huge expectation yeah. and a huge amount of labor to be responsible for helping somebody meet every need that they have absolutely fucking not like that i do not want to sign up for that um and i also don't want to sign up for the people i love and care about not getting their needs met right I also don't want to be the center of somebody's life. Uh, I want people to be able to have lives outside of me. And so for me, polyamory really is about the beauty of that, right? Of being able to be part of people's lives, multiple people's lives, being able to have intimacy that looks in ways that feels really great for me. So like mm -hmm. I, it is really hard for me to engage in romantic relationships, traditional ideas of romantic relationships, right? Sure. I don't do that. It doesn't feel good for me. It doesn't feel real. Mm. Like flowers to me are not meaningful. I'm like, why did yeah. you buy me something that is going to die in front of me? I understand other people love them, but like for me, it doesn't work. Having expectations put on me feels really gross. I'm fine trying to meet people's expectations when we have a talk about them and both consent to them as opposed to them just being imposed. Um, and I think yeah. this also too works a lot around my neurodiversity, right? Is I right, I'm not gonna be able to call somebody every day. Realistically, it's not my brain is like, nah, that feels really gross unless I want to, right? If that is like something that inherently my brat buddy is like, cool, it's like noon, we're gonna call so and so. Great, like I'm happy to do it, but my body is not gonna do that. And so polyamory for me really, again, is about like right, building that community and making sure community members' needs are being met. Mm. Um, so I'm very, I say I'm very touch greedy. I am. I'm very touch greedy. There's no such thing as too much touch, right? Which if I like depended only on one person for that, that would be exhausting because I am insatiable. There is not enough touch that I could get, right? Which would be really exhausting for one person. But to be able to outsource that, to be mm. like, cool, who needs touch today? Like who has the capacity to give touch or who needs it, right? Like, yeah. great, I am your person. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's really too about being able to ensure the people you love needs are being met and not just by you and mm. trusting that they can get their needs met elsewhere if, right, you don't have the capacity to do something that you would normally provide. I There's been a lot of conversations I've had with people I've been in relationships with about, hey, like, I know that you're really struggling right now or you're really grieving and I would love to hold space for you, but I'd be lying if I said I had the capacity to because mm. um, I don't, but I want you to be able to have that from somebody. So yeah. can you please call X, Y, or Z? Yeah. Um, because I know those people may also be able to provide support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, this sounds like love with boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely love with boundaries. Yeah. And for me, it's also part of like being honest, right? Yeah. About like what I'm actually able to show up for, mm -hmm. um, which takes a lot of self-reflection. Um, and for me, I have found that really helpful to frame it in this honesty framework. Because like before I had it framed of like, no, I need to show up for this person because that's how I show up like that I love and care about them. And then I had, uh, I worked a 12 step program at Al-Anon for a long period of time. Um, and my sponsor was absolutely amazing. Uh, and Meg used to say like, are you being honest? Because can you actually show up for this person? Because what I'm hearing is you don't have capacity, mm -hmm. which means that they're actually not able to get what they need, right? Because if you're not able to actually show up, then you're not, right? Then you're not only harming yourself, but you're also harming them. Oh. And so at that point, you might as well just be honest. Right. And, and hope that like, and trust that they're able to get their needs met elsewhere. And I was like, oh my God, it's not about me being selfish. It's about me being honest and having enough love and compassion and trust yeah. to like, let this person go and get their needs met elsewhere. And yeah. for me, that was really powerful being able to reframe, reframe that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you feel like you're being selfish for not being there for them. Yes. Yeah. You feel like you're being selfish, right? And like people who are selfish are bad. You don't want to be a selfish person. Yeah. Um, so reframing it is like an act of love, right? It it's is. like, I love you so much. I, I agree. I want you to get your needs met. And I am not the person for that today. We can try again tomorrow. 
but it's it's not a today thing. Yeah, I mean, I always bring it back to that analogy of, you know, the plane's coming down in a crash. You put on your mask first, and then you put on the mask of your child, right? The relationship there, but like you can't mm -hmm. breathe, or we and we talk about it in energy too, right? Like you can't keep pouring from an empty cup. There are the spoons again, right? Mm -hmm. And also what you were talking about earlier about how difficult it is, or being in a relationship where it's safe enough to say no, yes. right? This is this is the hard part too of being the one who delivers the no. Mm hmm. Yes, and it's interesting because I find in relationship with people, I don't actually feel like I can trust somebody until they say no to me. Mm, um, because yeah. if I don't hear that no, then I feel like I have to do all that extra labor to read between the lines. Is this something that they're really wanting to do? Um, is this something that they're just saying yes to because they feel like they need to? Um, and I think a lot about too, like, I don't want to hang out with somebody who is like, doesn't have the capacity or is not super stoked about it or like even moderately excited or too tight, right? Like I want people to be able to take care of themselves. Like I will be fine. My schedule is so full. Like if somebody cancels plans with me, I am happy to have a day off. And realistically, like that's not even what would happen. Sure. Um, and yeah. for me, it's also, <laughs> it's also really relieving when that's who I surround myself in where like if I need to cancel plans because I am too exhausted or over capacity, and they say, awesome, thanks for letting me know. Like, let me know when we can reschedule if that's something you're open to. And like, that's it. Like, that is so freeing. And I don't love the phrase, but even when people are like, thank, like, thank you for taking care of yourself. Like, that feels a little weird for me because it's that's like, of course, weird. I'm going to take care of myself. Yeah. But I also understand where that's coming from. Like, the intention and the meaning behind it is great. But I do appreciate when people are like, thank you for sharing that. And like, trusting me with that. Or... Thank you for, yeah, really feeling comfortable enough to share that with me. Like, yeah. I hope you enjoy your time to yourself or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. I find really, really, it's like that freeing of expectations feels really great for me. Going back to your question about like, yeah. what does polyamory look like for me? That is definitely part of it is the uh, removal of uh, these expectations that are supposed to be inherent in relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And so like when we talk about romantic relationships, we talk about the ro the, the uh, relationship escalator, right? Pulling the students to see what relationship um, escalators look like for them, right? So the first thing we do, right, is we meet and then we go on a date. And then after three dates, maybe we have sex and then we sure. meet friends and then we meet parents sure. and then maybe we move in together, right? And this escalator looks different but it's always there. Mm -hmm. And so what I wind up pointing out to people is if the end goal is happily ever after, which it really is, and it's really death, um, which can be happily ever after, but for most people is not because one person dies before the other and whatever. It's yeah. a little morbid. Yeah. Or it ends in divorce or whatever. But what we're saying is if this is the escalator, then what we're basically doing is picking out the person that we're going to be dying with, right? On our first date, we're if we decide to go on a second date, we are basically saying that this person is good enough at that point to die and spend the rest of our lives together, right? Which is really kind of crazy to be looking for this person who we're going to marry and die with the first time we meet with somebody, right? Because that's what the escalator does. Yeah. It also basically says that if we end a relationship, right, that that relationship was a failure instead of seeing it as something that we were learning or growing from, finding that positive of like, hey, yeah, like my last relationship ended right? Because my trauma and their trauma did not go well together, right? We activated each other. It was not great. Yeah. But like, I survived a huge part of grad school with that person and like was able to like really, like that person paved the way for me really to like come into polyamory and come into being non-binary, right? And come mm -hmm. into like my queerness more. And if it wasn't for them, right? Like that relationship wasn't great, but if it wasn't for them, I was, wouldn't be able to be where I'm at. And so Again, like for me, it's it's really calling into question those assumptions yeah. uh, and also the value of relationships, right? Like I uh, don't love the term. I, it's not the term relationship anarchy. I don't like how it's kind of thrown around as like the pinnacle of what a consensual non-monogamy should look like, right? Because mm. like I'm a huge person who's like, however people are doing consensual non-monogamy is like great. Um, there isn't a better way. There isn't the best way. There isn't a right way. If it works for you, 
and you're communicating about what that looks like to other people, then it works. But I do practice a lot of what's called relationship anarchy, where like, there is no, my romantic relationship does not mean more to me than my platonic relationships with people, right? Or relationships with family members, or people at work too, right? Like, it depends on what people need at different points in time. It depends on what I why, what I'm able to give. And it's funny because like sometimes the only way I can talk about it with people is like, say your best friend and your partner have a birthday on the same day. I'm not going to just like go to my partner's birthday party because like that's what I'm supposed to do, right? I might like split time between them. I also might skip my partner's birthday, my granny partner's birthday because I live with them, right? Like, and be like, hey, dude, I'll see you later. Or like the party's at our house. And so I'll be there late, but I don't feel guilty about it. And it's not just like automatically assume that, of course, I'm going to come to their birthday party um, because it's not always assumed that that is the most meaningful relationship with me yep. or for me. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we see that all the time in uh, dynamics where someone gets a new partner and, and maybe in a monogamous structure, whatever structure, a romantic partner. And they get an invite to a wedding and suddenly Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's my plus one. That is my plus one. We've been seeing each other for a month. That's my plus one, not my best friend that I've known for the last 10 years, right? So it's Mm -hmm. an interesting expectation in those sorts of dynamics. Well, yeah. And also too, like what if your partner is an introvert, right? And like does not like to dance and you want to go to a wedding and dance and you know if you bring your partner – Like your partner is going to be sitting and they absolutely shouldn't have to dance because you want to, right? And maybe they don't want to sit alone at the table. And so maybe bringing your best friend is the best option because your best friend likes to dance, exactly, right? Yeah, absolutely. But there's this cultural expectation that at a wedding, Mm -hmm. bring your partner of, you know, whatever that may be to that sort of event. So absolutely. And I think this is where I've been able to like, Try, at least, okay, I'm trying to hold space for the reality of people who choose monogamy always, right? Mm-hmm. Myself included at times. And like how I think monogamy and relationship anarchy aren't shouldn't be as far apart, I think, ideologically, in theory. Like I think if people want the monogamous structure of one sexual main primary partner dynamic, you have to understand the beauty of the relationships outside of that primary partner. You can choose to want to die with someone. I think that is a beautiful choice to say that I'm going to continually invest in this relationship and make that duty and commitment. It's a beautiful thing that will have a different kind of relationship than others that don't have that sort of lifelong commitment for that. Mm -hmm. But you will not thrive in that relationship, dare I say with confidence right now, if you expect everything from that one relationship and ignore the importance of all the other relationships in your life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the key things that I'm like hearing you say is it's about that intentionality, right? It's about intentionally choosing a person, right? It's about intentionally wanting to die with one person, right? It's about that intention. And for me, I, you can't have an intention to do something if you don't know that there are other options. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. And sure, so, like, if yeah. you don't know non monogamy, right? Consensual non monogamy is an option, then how can you be intentional about choosing monogamy? And so, it's only been lately, it's been super cool where I'll meet people and they're like, oh, cool, you're polyamorous. Like, me and my partner or me and my husband thought about that and we intentionally decided that wasn't for us. And I'm like, yes. I love that, right? Because in my head, not only in my head, but from what I see from those relationships is those folks are engaging in relationship anarchy, right? Because they don't have those, like, they have really meaningful connections with friends and family, and they're not always going to pick their spouse above everybody else. But yeah, they are sexually monogamous, which I always say is like the biggest potential like DS dynamic or like the kinky dynamic, right? But that's like a whole nother thing is to say like, 
I am your one person for the rest of your life and I am controlling your sexuality. I'm like, that is, that is so kinky and people don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's all about the perspective, right? Of whether Mm -hmm. you see it as a trap or you see it as a kink. And I think depending on how you see the world, the paradigms, that's how you'll understand that dynamic, which actually ends up affecting your enjoyment of the sex that you're having in it, which is all the complex psychology of it. But I Mm -hmm. think you're hitting on something so important that to be a conscious consumer of anything we need to know our options yes and that's part of the problem is society has not presented us with enough mostly because within western culture this is more of a novel concept what we're embarking on to try and do we're still creating language and terms within our like culture for these things right Mm -hmm. but media and all the rest of culture has not caught on to this yet to reflect options we don't see polyamorous families in media we don't hear about polyamorous music we don't have polyamorous fairy tales you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like we just don't even have the lore of it yet to see that future so it's hard to even see it as an option Mm -hmm. or if we do have like aspects of non-monogamy consensual non-monogamy it's usually unicorn like unicorn hunting Mm -hmm. right which is like a heterosexual couple who for like Uh, the husband's birthday the wife is like let's find a woman to give you know to bring us into the sexual fantasy right like that's usually what i have seen in media um which like unicorn hunting is not inherently bad right it's not inherently bad no matter what some people think when it is done again consensually with which means that like the intention of this being a one-time thing or this intention of it being focused on the husband and the husband's pleasure or the wife's pleasure or whoever's pleasure is like made very clear, right? Yep. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Up front, those sorts of things are discussed. The emotional Mm -hmm. capacity, what sort of things we want to have in this relationship. Is it primarily sexual? Is there an opportunity for anything emotional? And to be Mm -hmm. able to know those things before you go into that dynamic is I think how you provide informed consent to what people are walking into. Yes. And also, too, not lying about it in order to get your needs met. And like also remembering that like sex work, hire a sex worker, pay somebody to fulfill that right desire or dream that you have. We do it for so many things. And so I don't like for me, it doesn't I'm like, why don't we also do it for sex? Right. If we want we hire right? Experts in so many different areas that meet our needs to fulfill our fantasies. Like if I want to go on a tour of like Morocco, I'm going to hire and pay somebody to give me a tour of Morocco. I'm not going to just like try to like meet somebody there and exploit their labor, exploit what they're good, right? Like whatever it is, I'm going to pay somebody for their time and their expertise, like their expertise. And so like also remembering like that, that is a thing that people can do. Yes, a hundred percent. I think even um, another good example is I could pay money to get completely naked, lay on a table and have someone massage my whole body in oil. But dear God, do they touch my genitals and do anything there? Oh my God, what have we done? You know, like we're, mm-hmm. it's, we just can't even comprehend the idea, you know, but yes. it's so fat, like it's so close. The hypocrisy is so like clear. Uh-huh. It's like, oh, sex is bad. Can we ask why? Why? Mm-hmm. Yep. And as long as those conversations are there, like there really is like what, a few inches difference between right? Genitals and non-genitals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. And so, yeah, yeah, in a monogamous structure, this is a great thing to do if you want to have that sort of experience outside of the dynamic and also have it in a very contained emotional container, right? Because mm-hmm. that can be the situation with the unicorn. It's hard to, even with the best of consent and all of those sorts of discussions, it's impossible to prevent any sort of emotional attachment that may occur during that dynamic, right? We can best of intentions, Mm -hmm. but things happen compared to a professional service where you have it contained in which that's Mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. It's different. Yeah. It's the conversation sometimes I like, I think about having with swingers. I don't have it with them. Mm. Yeah. They didn't ask me for my opinion. (laughs) Um, But this idea oftentimes when I'll talk with swingers, who oftentimes are like, oh, we're okay having sex with other people, but we can't do any of the romance or the intimacy or the emotional connection. I'm like, that's like in my head, I'm like, that's really cute that you think you can prevent that from happening. You can try, 
right? You can say like, we'll only play with these people like once every eight months or when these parties happen or whatever, but like feelings happen. Like you can't not catch feelings. Like that's why, right? Like they're tossed at you. They're going to hit you whether you put up your hand or not. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, but right, like when you work with a sex worker, right? It takes two people to catch feelings. And if it's a professional setting, like, no, that that doesn't happen. Absolutely. Yep. And I think that's a key thing you're hitting on there is the professionalism of it. Because even as a therapist, a psychologist, right? Sometimes those feelings can't arise, but it's because of the boundaries of the legal Mm -hmm. profession that the person enacting the service is very conscious of that and will put up their own boundaries to ensure that doesn't happen, Mm -hmm. right? And that's a dynamic that is not going to happen in a, you know, other sort of situation with a non-professional because they're not taught how to do that. Yep. Yep. And they're not self-aware enough to know where their boundaries have to be to keep Mm -hmm. those relationships professional. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. These are the nuances of this whole thing. It, there's so mm-hmm. many pieces to it. This is such a complex thing to be pulling apart, and I appreciate your sociology lens to it, right? Because I think Absolutely. all of it is just so deeply cultural, mm-hmm. used with expectations, value systems, hierarchies. That when, yeah, kind of like you said earlier, when you start to question sexuality and then gender, and then you go along the line, and now you're here asking what is any of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? Like if gender is a social construct and sexuality is a social construct and monogamy is a social construct, right? Like monogamy does not have to look like you only have one person in your life. Like what else? What else is socially constructed? But like also I think it's important to acknowledge that even though it's socially constructed, things do have real physical manifestations, right? So like We can say gender is a social construct, but we know that women get paid less than men, right? We know that black and brown people and indigenous folk and people of color, right, experience systemic racism, right? Just because race is a social construct doesn't mean Mm -hmm. that there is not real material consequences for for folks because of these constructs. Um, and so that also becomes hard, right? Like, what do what do we do when things are socially constructed but have real material consequences? I mean, right? abs- they have meaning. <laughs> oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, think about the legalness of the system of marriage and the mm-hmm. benefits that come with that. That is a culturally constructed idea that is going to affect polyamorous people significantly differently or significantly different. Sure, whatever, that's double right. double adverb, whatever, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, literally a embodiment of what you're talking about, that cultural presence. Yep. And I think that's the reality too of it is, you know, you can say it's all just culture, but there are literal forms of oppression that will affect you differently depending on how you choose to navigate that culture with chosen identities like polyamory. Although mm-hmm. that's, do you think that's a chosen identity? That might even be a question. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, I would say like, no, in the yeah. same way, like being non-binary is sure. necessarily chosen. Yeah. Um, Like, and I don't necessarily think that like, it's only a biology, right? It's a mixture of everything. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so many different things, but like I, I've been looking into like even having legal protections for me, my grounding partner, right? We live together, we share an apartment, but God forbid something happens to one of us. What like they are on my life insurance, but outside of that, like, do they get to decide what happens to my belongings? Like probably because my mom would be Mm -hmm. like, I don't want this decision. Like I trust Tom to do it. Um, But like, if for whatever reason she hated Tom, Tom might not be left with anything, right? Yeah. Um, unless we like took extra steps to make it happen that happen when you just get married, right? When you get married, those are the things that like happen by default that like people who make the decision, the conscious decision not to get married have to take a lot of legal steps, which means that they have to have access to an attorney or somebody who can show them how to do this, right? Which means yeah. that they have to have capital and money to be able to pay to make these things happen, which yeah. right doesn't. So again, right, there are huge consequences for people, 
even though these things are socially constructed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I remember, I'm not sure where I heard this, but some sort of podcast that had someone talking about platonic marriages because of this Mm -hmm. question of, right, as I get older, there is the reality, the reality that I am going to die. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be responsible for that and to make those decisions? Mm -hmm. And to uphold my decision. Absolutely. So like, if I want to be cremated and like, whoever wants my ashes, right, can have part of my ashes and I ask to be buried in a plant or one of my, right, whatever, sure. whatever yeah. the stuff we have that comes up with death, like, yeah. who do I trust to make sure that that is what happens instead of like, and the, my, my, this, my parents would not do this, but like, instead of my parents burying me in the family plot, sure. right, which I, that's not how I want to be disposed of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I think those are like really important is like even having conversations with, you know, our our friends and our loved ones and people we're in relationship with about like, hey, like I want you to be included in these processes. And that means like we need to figure out how to be able to legally uphold these things, right? How do we have two people making decisions for us, right? If we are incapacitated or um, how do we, you know, like tax stuff, right? Like if you're living with two people, right? How do tax benefits work? I don't know. How do you buy a house together, right? You incorporate, I guess, from when I've talked to other people about Mm -hmm. is like, because you can't have marriage with three people, um, even though you might have multiple relationships with people. And that means like, potentially one person gets a tax. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All All these tax things, but also child rearing absolutely you have multiple parents how does that happen absolutely absolutely the system currently does not have space for that level of diversity Mm -hmm. but also too like not only just polyamory but like your aunt has been like your primary caregiver for years but your parents still have legal guardianship like if something happens and you're a young person and you're in the hospital right unless you're aunt has that you know guardianship mm-hmm. I don't know what it's called waiver or whatever like it's gonna be in your parents to make those decisions even though like maybe you're trans and they don't yep. want you to have trans affirming care yep. but your aunt who lives with you is in support right and so mm-hmm. like while your aunt might be your primary caretaker legally they're not your guardian right Absolutely. and so again thinking about that or maybe your aunt is raising you and doesn't get the tax tax break right, of raising you because you are not, quote unquote, their child. Mm, Yeah, the system is not set up for chosen family. Nope. Nope. No. Mm. Yeah, you're hitting on so many important things. I think that to anyone listening, hopefully we'll see the ways that culture (laughs) is imbued through our relationships and how we move about through the world how we understand value, how we see our futures. It's so deeply ingrained through all of it. And I think, yeah, you hit on such a good point that once you start questioning all of it, it kind of gets hard to not see this everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 When I used to teach sociology classes, students at like midway through the semester, right, would start seeing this stuff everywhere and be like, how do you wake up in the morning? This is all so depressing, right? Like, how do we get out of bed? And I'm like, that is really true. I see where you're at right now. And like, that's also why we talk about like change, right? Here are the things that we can do now that we've deconstructed everything and everything is a pile of shit. How do we make it better, right? And again, that comes back for me to community, right? How do we work mm-hmm. together, right? To create these bonds, to make things better for everybody, Mm. not just our community, but everybody as a whole. Yeah. Because we don't, when one person suffers, we all suffer together through ripples Mm -hmm. of how that person affects their community, affects their choices and reflects out. So there is this reality that as we heal, we have to do it together. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I want to hold space if there is anything lingering on your heart that maybe we didn't hit. We hit a lot of great stuff. This has been (laughs) phenomenal. But I just want to hold a little bit of space if anything's lingering. No, I think this was great. Thanks for giving me this space. Absolutely. This is so much fun. This is all theory (laughs) that I just love to eat up. 
Yeah. Well, then there is one last question I ask everyone on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, what is one thing that you wish other people knew was more normal? Mm. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that is coming to me right now is like, you do not have to meet somebody's every need. Like that is not your responsibility. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> people let that sink in. That is real. <laughs> Wait, it's huge. Yes. It takes so much burden, especially in romantic relationships within that structure that like you have to be someone's everything or in family mm -hmm. dynamics as well or the friend that is suffering and you feel like you want to pull them out of that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We I, like it's, it's taken me a long time to learn, but I do not have that power. No. Like I do not get to like fix my best friend's depression, right? Or like a family member's addiction or, you know, even like the jealousy that a partner may be experiencing, right? And so for me, that has been probably one of the most healing things for me is like, yeah. I am not responsible for meeting everybody's needs. Absolutely. And even if you were responsible, right, in theory and paid, aka psychologists in training <laughs> for that sort of requirement, mm -hmm. that is not something I can even do with the skill set I am trained in to do that. I cannot mm -hmm. change or nope. heal anybody, right? Nope. You can lead a horse to water and they have to drink. And also there has to be water in their community, right? Yes. Yep. I see someone for an hour. I can't control the rest of what goes on in their world. So it's like, yes, taking that responsibility off of ourselves to remember mm -hmm. that part of what we need to do to show up in good relationship with other people is to understand ourselves and what we need and therefore be able to communicate that and then have better relationship rather than saying like, how can I fix you? How can I save you? How can I do this? And ignoring mm -hmm. all that is coming up for you as you pour from your empty cup and you lose all of your spoons. Yeah. I mean, I also would probably push it a little further too, is like, I'm also not solely responsible for meeting all my mm. needs, right? Yeah. Um, right. And it comes back to the community yeah. aspect. Like, it's okay to ask other people to help and support your needs yeah, yeah, if yeah, yeah, they yeah. are available for that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the interdependence in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a beautiful add on. Yeah. Mm. This has been such a juicy conversation. These are my favorite topics. I'm doing relationship anarchy for my dissertation. So this oh, is- Oh, amazing. Yeah. 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 So the whole time I'm chatting, I'm like, <laughs> these are good things I need to write down. I need to add to my <laughs> dissertation. So this is just fun when it's a think tank, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out, yeah. Absolutely. Collectively bring that in. No, it's so helpful. Definitely. Absolutely. Is there anywhere you'd want to plug to social medias for you? I'm not sure if you're trying to build a social following. Um, that is not actively a goal, but you can. Oh, like you can always follow me on Instagram. Sure. <laughs> it's yeah. Je Jesse J E S S E F A F A Y E O five. Um, and that's probably my Instagram is probably the best way to kind of keep in contact with what I am doing or my LinkedIn. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing so much. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. I yeah. appreciate this. This is yeah. great. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. If you enjoyed today's episode, then leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you're a part of the Anarchist community, then follow us on Instagram or nominate a guest for the show by sending in a letter to modernanarchypodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.